Well, thank you all for watching the film, and I can't even believe what an, a beautiful job of portraying the agony that our kids and their families are in. But as you've just heard, the movie is also about hope, and um, I am very grateful as well as humbled to be able to speak to you tonight and say that we are this close to having a very effective testing for this disease so it isn't just the parent's description, as well as much more effective prevention measures. And in large part, that's due to my, my colleagues on the panel. They're the ones on the ground doing the hard work, so thank you all. With that, we'll just remind you that the entire group of acute onset uh, illnesses is known as PANS for Pediatric Acute Onset Neuropsychiatric Syndrome. And that acuity uh, was described best by the French who used the term foudroyant or lightning-like to describe how these children are just struck down by obsessive compulsive symptomatology, eating restrictions, tics, uh, Dr. Schulman and I were talking earlier about some of the possibilities that perhaps this explains some children who receive a diagnosis of childhood bipolar disorder because of the tremendous emotional lability and the mood swings that our children experience. But to meet full criteria for PANS, it does still need to be OCD or eating disorders, and we're looking at the other symptom profiles. Plus, at least two of seven of the other neurologic behavioral emotional, and cognitive changes. Very, very important is that third criterion, and we tend to forget about it. It absolutely is imperative that the clinicians consider a wide range of differential diagnoses. The first patient sent to me for our Sydenham Korea study actually had lupus. They didn't think she did because she was a nine-year-old girl, and it isn't supposed to happen until you're an adolescent. Well, it did in her. So lupus, autoimmune encephalitis, Sydenham Korea, you're going to see an example of that, which is basically pandas plus neurochorioathetoid uh, movements, lupus and other things, and also please remember psychosocial traumas. Two girls in our uh, drug trial for OCD had uh, extreme contamination fears, some hand washing, genital scrubbing, and in both cases they had been sexually abused. So it's important to think about it, include it in the differential, but once you've excluded it as a possibility, please do move on and uh, consider the possibility that you're at the point of giving the clinical diagnosis of PANS. When those symptoms are associated with strep as a trigger, either a strep infection in the child or more often an exposure to a sibling, a cousin, a close playmate, somebody they spent the night with, somebody they sat next to in the classroom who has a strep. And in our last IVIG trial, we actually included strep uh, exposures within the classroom because uh, group A strep is such a contagious disorder that just a few hours of exposure is sufficient to infect the child. From the earliest days, we knew that rheumatic fever happened in children in whom the strep lingered in the oropharynx, in the throat, for at least three to five days. So that child who doesn't have uh, much of a sore throat, maybe they have a little fever, maybe they have a little tummy ache or headache, and then goes on to develop the sequelae is the one we're thinking about. So PANDAS is just PANS in which the symptoms are triggered by strep infections. Unfortunately, it's the only one that's really had a, a clinical or research attention for the past 20 years. So we are extrapolating from what we know about pandas to the larger group of children with pans, but some of those extrapolations may not be appropriate. And I hear all the time when I come to meetings like this and, and meet with the, the families in my own community about the children who didn't respond uh, as might be expected if it was a pandas. So we're keeping an open mind and, and fortunately now have a consortium of about 14 academic centers who have at least two that's what people, mostly to hold each other up, um, but at least two people who are working in this area, either clinically or uh, on research side, and with that, we're gonna be able to learn much more about the non-PANDAS uh, acute presentations. So at least two of the following comorbidities, and it's primarily separation anxiety, about 98% of the children. Panic attacks happen in nearly half of the children. Emotional lability and irritability. Literally a child who goes from laughing to crying in a flash of a second and then back to laughing or perhaps screaming at the parent without any apparent precipitant. 
Behavioral regression, we've had 10-year-old boys who suddenly started crawling again or playing with their infant sibling's toys, talking baby talk, or in some cases actually becoming mute and uh, completely nonverbal for a period of time. We'll skip down actually to the motoric or sensory abnormalities because that tends to go along with the, the children who are sort of regressing and pulling back. And in those cases, light, sounds, smells, textures, the waistbands on the uh, pants are too tight, the socks don't feel quite right, they can't get dressed because the textures are wrong. Or in some cases, they can't eat because the food texture is, is a problem. Motoric abnormalities, this is where we stuck the ticks in uh, pans, so it isn't true that they were left out completely. It's just that we de-emphasized them in an effort to uh, relieve some of the controversy. Urinary frequency, urgency, and secondary enuresis I've put now in its own category because to me this is the pathognomonic sign of pandas. Pathognomonic means it, when you see it, that's what it is. And if you have a child who has an abrupt onset of a behavioral abnormality, plus they suddenly start wetting the bed again, having daytime accidents, or needing to void 5, 10, 15, 20 out times an hour, that child has PANS until proven otherwise. And the final category is academic difficulties. These typically are your superstar kids. Very bright, gifted, they've been in advanced classes all of their life, and suddenly a child who is doing multiplication in his head with you know two or three columns is unable to add even the simplest numbers. Visual spatial skills deficits, concentration difficulties, and the motoric hyperactivity. It isn't subtle. These children have, on average, five of the comorbid symptom categories at the same time as they have their onset of OCD. So they literally are struck down, foudroyant onset of this illness. Here's an example of the behavioral regression as well as some dysgraphia. The panel to the left, the child drew before they got sick, and then during the illness, just scribble scrabble. Tanya Murphy and her colleagues at the University of Florida uh, and now at uh, University of South Florida, have used the Ray Osteris complex figure test in their patients with pandas. This is normally a test of working memory in which the actual test is to apply it five, is to redraw it five minutes later by memory. The kids are do okay with that, but what they can't do is copy the figure on the left to the right. They put the lines in the wrong places, they start with a triangle instead of starting with the, the large rectangle, and it just becomes a huge mess. Well, I, it's a very fast introduction, so we're going to jump right into the model of disease mechanism for pandas. And in the 1980s, uh, one of the very first things I did was to look for strep in our patients with OCD because Judy Rappaport, the head of child psychiatry, was looking for a medical model for this disease, and she was an extremely well-read physician. And what she knew was that in rheumatic fever, particularly Sydenham chorea, obsessive compulsive symptomatology happens in about two-thirds of the cases usually two to four weeks before the movements began. So we just borrowed the model of etiopathogenesis for Sydenham chorea and rheumatic fever and used it for pandas. And what that says is that certain strains of the group A strep put antigens, put uh, components on their cell wall that mimic the human host. And by doing that, they can hide from the immune system because the immune system is designed to detect foreign versus self. The uh, immune system eventually cottons to this molecular mimicry, and it makes antibodies against those antigens on the strep cell wall. And unfortunately, those antibodies react with the child's own tissues. In the case of rheumatic heart disease, it's against the valves of the heart. Arthritis is against the joints. Sydenham chorea is against the brain only in a certain proportion of children. And I get this question all the time. Why is panda so rare when strep is so common? Well, it's because you have to be genetically susceptible. And you heard Dr. Frankovic talk about that in the movie, that we're now finding the HLA subtypes, the immune categories that may put the children at risk. If it's true, and if we can replicate Dr. Frankovic's study, then we actually have a lab test that we can do to determine if the child is vulnerable. But let's assume that they are. So you've got a bad strep, 
in an unlucky child that through the process of molecular mimicry gives rise to a misdirected immune response. And I've settled on misdirected, we used to call it autoimmune, hence the title pandas, but in actual fact, it's a temporary loss of tolerance. There's no evidence that that initial immune response is defective, it's just directed against the wrong thing. It gives rise to these complex behavioral syndromes. We know that the antibodies have biologic activity. This panel is just a graph showing that the biologic activity of serum from children with Sydenham Korea increases 200%, uh, a marker of what's happening in the cell and cell signaling. In pandas, it's about 170%, and in typical controls, there's no change. Well, the concept that these cross-reactive antibodies and the temporary loss of tolerance led us to believe that if we could just get rid of those problematic antibodies, we could cure symptoms in these children. That can be done with plasmapheresis. Five single volume exchanges over a 10 day period removes 90 to 95% of the circulating antibodies. Bing, bang, bung, you're done. Except <laughs> to do plasmapheresis, I don't know how many of your children have had it, but you often have to uh, sedate the child, put a central line in, and the child has to remain in the hospital for that entire 10 day period because they have a central line going into a major vessel in their body. So it was optional and optimal, excuse me, optimal to try and find something that would mimic that effect without being so invasive. And we chose intravenous immunoglobulin or IVIG. And you heard about that a number of times in the movie as many of the children had received it. It's simpler, you can go to an infusion center, sit in a big lounge chair for four to six hours, get the infusion of intravenous immunoglobulins. And the thought is that the antibodies that are being uh, transmitted through that infusion actually interact with the problematic antibodies in the child and pull them out of circulation. Or perhaps they just inactivate them, or perhaps it's one of a dozen other mechanisms that's been proposed, but what we know is it appears to work. Since it's the NIMH and since, as you've heard, this was a controversial disease, it was extremely important that we have an adequate control in this trial. So children were randomly assigned by the NIH pharmacy either to get the plasmapheresis or to get IVIG or placebo. And it was saline that was sent by the pharmacy in wrapped bottles, wrapped tubes. The nurses administered it in exactly the same way as the IVIG. And when the kids left the hospital at the end of the week, nine of the 10 children who received the placebo thought that they had gotten the active treatment. So we did a good job of blinding this study at the initial infusion. When it came back, we could tell just by looking at the child actually, whether they'd gotten the real IVIG and on average had a 45% reduction in symptoms after that first month, or whether they had gotten placebo, which evoked no improvement in OCD symptoms, tics, or the other behaviors. Our favorite was actually the plasmapheresis. We had a 65% reduction in symptom severity, and many of the children were actually better by the time they left the hospital. In part, because it appears that the immunomodulatory treatments were acting directly on the brain. You heard from Dr. Montello that she looks at the structure as well as the function of the brain with neuroradiology. This is an early uh, patient in the plasmapheresis trial. He actually had plasmapheresis. When he came to us, he was spending about 95% of his waking hours doing a variety of compulsive rituals, terrible symmetry concerns so that things had to be lined up exactly right, and contamination fears and fears that somebody was going to hurt his mother. His caudate is about 20% larger than would be expected for his age, sex, and weight. And following successful treatment with plasmapheresis, the size of the caudate had normalized, and much more importantly, his symptoms had completely remitted. Dr. Harry Shigani and his colleagues at Wayne State University took this the next step to look a bit at function using positron emission tomography. They chose a ligand that binds to activated microglia. And just like the CAM kinase was a marker of cell signaling, the activated microglia is a marker of in neuroinflammation. And in our patients with PANDAS, the pre-treatment uh, scans showed increased inflammation in the caudate and the putamen that improved following IVIG administration in patients whose symptoms also improved. So what does it mean for my child or my patient for the clinicians who are still here? <laughs> 
history is absolutely key. What I didn't show you was that when we tried plasmapheresis on children who had non-PANDAS OCD, there was zero impact. When Dr. Hoekstra in Den Denmark tried IVIG for non-PANDAS Tourette syndrome, zero impact. So it is extraordinarily important that we get the diagnosis right and that we not use these immunomodulatory treatments on children who don't need them. Because if a child doesn't have that acute onset and this particular complex of symptoms, they're just a child with pandas. That's actually my oldest grandson three years ago, but he's even cuter now. <laughs> so pans, pandas, most important thing in my opinion is the history. I think that that's actually part of the controversy is the fact that uh, we take very long and complex histories, and uh, some of the neurologists depend more on the physical exam. Physical exam is quite helpful, but maybe not so much for the neurologic abnormalities as for the presence of an occult infection. And it's incredibly important to undress the child, as you heard Dr. Latimer talk about in the film. You have to look for the strep. Look for choreiform movements, which are fine piano playing movements on the stressed uh, neurologic posture. You need to rule out rheumatic fever and the other causes we've already talked about, and test for strep. Swab the throat. I've been saying the same thing now for over 30 years. If all you do is a throat culture and every child presenting with behavioral abnormalities, I will be a very, very happy woman. Now those children who have uh, obsessional fears of vomiting, of choking, or other food restrictions, a swallowing study may be necessary. In Sydenham, Korea, you have voluntary and involuntary movements that are discoordinated, and swallowing requires you to have a very good coordination of the voluntary and involuntary movements. Polysomnography or a sleep study might be helpful because about 85% of the children with pandas have an abnormality. It's quite specific to this disease. It points to the basal ganglia because what you see is a failure to establish peripheral paralysis during REM sleep. So REM is rapid eye movement sleep. They used to say it was because your eyes are following your dreams. It is the state of sleep during which dreams are supposed to occur. And to keep you from acting out those dreams, you're paralyzed but not our poor children with pandas. And they frequently talk about waking up out of their nightmares. An electroencephalogram and our EEG might be helpful to rule out encephalopathy. You wanna look for regional slowing as well as uh, the presence of epileptiform activity. And I believe that any child who's sick enough to be presenting to the emergency room with behavioral abnormalities should have an assessment for antineuronal antibodies and it can only be done by doing a lumbar puncture. What do we, how do we treat? We eradicate the infection with three to four uh, weeks of antibiotics. Consider immunomodulatory therapy, maybe not something as invasive as IVIG or plasmapheresis. Maybe you wanna start with non-steroidal anti-inflammatories or with a steroid burst, or as you heard in the movie, a longer course of steroids. The PANDAS Physicians Network has guidance available, and hopefully, I've been saying this, for a couple of months now, so don't believe me, but we think that in two weeks, the Journal of Child and Adolescent Psychopharmacology is going to publish a four-part series on treatment of PANS pandas that includes sort of the coordination of care, use of antibiotics, use of immune therapies, and very importantly, use of traditional uh, psychiatric modalities. After the acute phase of illness, <laughs> all three. After the acute phase of illness, it is my opinion that pandas pans patients should be treated with the same regimen as other cases of childhood onset OCD. In fact, we refer all of our kids and their parents to behavior therapy as soon as we meet them in hopes that they'll be able to uh, treat the symptoms and that the parents will learn the techniques to keep the child from getting sicker. So I'm going to just close because I see my time is up. Reminding you of the model and reminding you that we use Sydenham Korea as our, as our medical model for this disease because in Sydenham's we knew, or thought we did, that strep was the causative agent. Over the past 25 years, and in large part because the controversy was roiling about, primarily uh, concerning the role of strep, we have developed five lines of evidence that strep is etiologically related to pandas. And I am quite confident that strep is the causative factor for the majority of the children. Here is a patient with Sydenham Korea. At her baseline, you saw 
I think you saw this film in the movie. She has sort of truncal uh, instability. She's got motor weakness, but most importantly, she's got these adventitious movements. As she tries to take a step, everything kind of flops around. She got plasmapheresis, and here she is two weeks later. Complete change in her physical appearance. If I show, could show you her face, she went from completely downtrodden and depressed to smiling and happy. What we can't see here is the fact that this young lady had uh, crippling obsessive compulsive symptoms as had been described in 1922 uh, by Iba and by Hamas and others. So we've known from now almost 100 years that obsessive compulsive symptomatology is associated with Sydenham's, with post-streptococcal illnesses. And the use of antibiotics can prevent those future occurrences if you can prevent the strep. I know somebody's gonna ask the question, so I'll just anticipate that by telling you, yes, we know that strep is not the only thing that can make this happen. Strep is the inciting trigger, but then the response generalizes through the innate immune response, and you end up having a flare with a psychosocial trauma, which opens the blood-brain barrier or other things. And with that, I'm actually gonna stop because uh, my colleague, Dr. Algu, is going to tell you all about how that happens. Thank you.